Hello everybody, Joshua here again, just doing a follow-up video to the one that I put out the other day, which is more of an introductory video. In this one, I just want to flesh a little bit more who I am, who we are, where we're headed, uh, where we've come from, the vision we have, and the uh, direction we feel we are being led. As you know, probably um, minimally, but I think I mentioned something in my first video about as well as working on the business with my wife. I'm also uh, getting my book underway. I've just finished the first draft of my first book's manuscript about a month or two ago, I think. And the reason why it's pending is because we're waiting for some extra um, resources to go through the editing and publishing process. Until I've got a couple of books out there, it's uh, something we need to externally fund. And then once a few books are out there and on the shelves, then hopefully it'll start paying for itself. The process will get increasingly easier, not only because the funds will be uh, multiplied a little bit more, but also because understanding the process and how it all works will be a lot easier. I'm in the beginning stages of all of this right now, uh, but we're doing the business partly to help fund that endeavor, which will then help fund the overall big picture. But aside from that, the business has the same purpose as the writing, which is to encourage, inspire, and um, benefit those we can share such aspirations and such uh, endeavorings with. Our business is um, to, to be a help to others and to raise their, their standard of living on multiple levels. But the writing is more to... Um, Yes, entertain, encourage, inspire, but also to educate. And what I mean by that is quite often you read a book and you don't really feel any different after having read it. You don't feel more inspired. You don't feel more challenged, more educated. You don't feel smarter. Some books actually, for lack of better phrasing, and forgive the bluntness, make you feel stupider actually after having spent all that time reading them because you're feeling like a goof because you just wasted all this time that could have been better employed doing something else. Um, to the point where playing a video game might have been more worth your time than some of the books that are out there. But having said that, um, I think that I have an opportunity to share something that I've always loved doing. And it was after the challenge from my wife that I really decided to maybe take a little more seriously. What I mean by that ch challenge is that she said, you've got an ability. She goes, you've got an opportunity. Why don't you put it to use and see if it can't help with um, us making a living but also help benefit others as I know you want to do. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. 91,904 words later, I finished my first draft of my first book, which is the beginning of a series. And when I say series, I use the term loosely. What I mean by series is not same characters being repeated over and over, going through a series of different events that build on the last event or something else, which is what traditionally a series is known as. It's more like I'm having the same basic premise of a story style, same basic approach, and that unifies all the books I have in mind, plus more that might come through the pipe as time goes on, except one book, and I'll explain that after. That's the standalone deal on its own. But uh, the first book I've completed is directly at the tail end of the Civil War or the, the end of the Civil War, rather. Um, it's the tail end of 1865. We find our character coming back from war. Now, he's a bit uh, airy-fairy, I guess you could say, because he's got this idea that go off to war, fight the war, fight the bad guys, set everything right, all's well with the world, and you can go on with your day and everything's peachy keen. He's got that uh, 19th century mentality that most sitcoms have. Everything's wrapped after half half an hour or 45 minutes or an hour or whatever is, and everybody's all happy and all issues have been resolved and everybody's good to go hunky-dory. That's not life. And this story kind of touches on that reality that you have to realize that just because you go off to war doesn't mean you don't have things at home that are going to need fixed, dealt with, confronted. So without saying too much, he's got that whole element. Plus, um, the, el the other element that I'm throwing in plays into this as well. The idea to do historic fiction came about because I love creative writing and I love history. And I thought the best way to do that is to do historic fiction because it allows me the um, a wide enough berth to be creative, but I can do it within the context of something that I enjoy, something I love doing research on, 
it allows me to become a bit of a better person because I'm learning about stuff, appreciating things, people, events, whatever that happened. And I'm more knowledgeable. I can contribute to conversation more because I have something to offer in terms of some knowledge or something. But I don't want to do an historical treatise, which means I have to do a bibliography. I have to quote my sources. I have to make sure it's all accurate, make sure I don't plagiarize and all this kind of jazz. Any facts that I've presented in my book, I didn't plagiarize because I found a source of where they are. I reworded it in my own words to get across the same general fact or idea, but I didn't quote somebody verbatim because A, I'd have to quote that source or it's plagiarism. And that can be pretty hefty. And if I'm stating certain things, especially the more to some people might seem out there stuff, um, they're going to think I'm loony. But I think it's loony if you just accept what's spoon-fed to you without doing any research yourself to back up why you believe that to be true or not true, whatever the case may be. And here's the thing. We are quite often spoon-fed stuff, told it's the truth, and just kind of go along our merry way and accept it. We don't challenge it. We don't question it. We just accept it because that's the way it is. Whether it's my faith or my belief in history, I want to explore for myself what is the truth behind this stuff so I'm not just accepting what other people have told me and really having no basis of knowledge myself. That was demonstrated quite well if you um, if you remember the movie Good Will Hunting. I love the scene where Ben Affleck is talking to the guy and the guy's blah, 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 saying a bunch of junk because he wants to impress some girls and embarrass Matt Damon's friend. Matt Damon called him up and said, listen, the difference between you and people who actually know what they're talking about is you just dropped $150,000 on a college education you could have got a, for a buck ninety-five in lake charges at the public library. You know, the idea is that he could have done his own research and discovered the material for himself, but he just listened to a bunch of jive, regurgitated so he sounds impressive but he doesn't really have a clue what he's actually talking about those kind of people are actually not to sound rude but they're annoying because the person who actually can contribute to a conversation the person actually knows something about the subject matter they're talking about and so that's the same with writing I don't want to regurgitate a bunch of stuff without having some understanding of why that stuff is the way it is and so while I've created fictional characters and fictional setting and everything else, I've put it in the framework of a general overall historical moment in time that actually existed within the framework of some events that actually happened involving people that actually lived. And I'm interjecting my creative elements into that so my characters that are in the main thrust of the story are interacting with these historical figures amidst these historical events and they have their own trials and struggles amidst all of that. Then the third element that I'm throwing in, which has me kind of taking historical fiction and turning it a little on its ear, is that I am taking stuff that we have not been told in the history books. Okay, You look up Wikipedia, the events surrounding John Wilkes Booth and the events surrounding Lincoln's death and the aftermath of the Civil War and all that stuff. You're told, this is the truth. This is what happened to John Wilkes Booth, to Abraham Lincoln, to the U.S., to all these things. You're not told this over here, which actually has been shielded from you because the people involved, the people who perpetuated the real truth of those events don't want to be known. They prefer anonymity. They prefer to not be known to have been involved in certain aspects of those events because if they were, they'd have been indicted at the time. They would have been strung up at the end of a rope and their reputation obviously would have been shot. So they were more concerned about their reputation and more concerned about saving face than sharing the truth. And so my belief is that based on some documentaries I've watched, you know, things I've read, that what we were told was a cover-up. I'll say it again. It was a cover-up. And that should not be new to most of you because all of us have heard about conspiracies, cover-ups, JFK, Roswell, uh, Lincoln again, uh, all sorts of other things that we have been told this is the way it happened. But you want to know what? This is the way it happened. Is based on somebody's opinion, based on somebody's bias. The people who have the power, who have the clout, who have the money, who have the prestige, who have the authority in society at that time when those events are happening can shape the story any way they want. And the media quite often will, especially under pressure of bribes or whatever, bow to whatever has been told to them, even if they know what the actual truth is. So the, the media of the day was the newspapers. Media of the day was journalists. The media of the day was writers hello it wasn't tv it wasn't radio none of that stuff existed so who do you think was writing 
the, the, the history. The people in high paid positions, such as the government, who were involved with it, who paid off people to say, this is the story we want you to tell. Either those people knew the truth and were bribed, or they were led to believe something that wasn't true in the first place and accept it as truth. Because they didn't know any better. They're trusting that their government has their best interest at heart and the government is telling them the truth. Huh. Look at America today. Look at any country in the world today. Government does not have our best interest at heart. They tell you the story they want you to believe, not the story that you have the right to know and believe. And so my job as a writer is to disseminate the reality from what we were led to believe. The reality is I see it and deliver that as a possibility. I'm not giving you pat answers. What my job is, is to present questions so you go on a quest for yourself to journey into researching, to discovering, to exploring, to see what you can come to the conclusion of. And not just what Wikipedia tells you or what uh, Encyclopedia Britannica or Google tell you. Because those things are based on the information that those people who do those websites are privy to, are given. It's not their fault that they tell the wrong information because they're going on what they've been told. It's the fault of the people who created the lies and the cover-ups and the conspiracies in the first place. Why do you think X-Files had such a cult phenomenon? Because it touched on things that are conspiratorial in their very nature. My job as a writer is to share things from a different angle, different perspective, and cause you, as a reader, to think. Whether it's my bit in the business with my wife or my, my writing, my job is to encourage people, to inspire people, to educate people, to help people, to give them a little more wider perspective of the of the world at large and my joy is being able to see them take that information run with it and discover more and learn more and become better people because of the information that they have gained which gives them a greater understanding of the world and their place in it so this video is more to tell you a little bit about my side as a writer than as an entrepreneur I have the joy of being an entrepreneur with my wife but I have the greater joy of being able to lean on her wisdom because she is the Richard Branson of this organization. I'm the person who's kind of come along learning how to change my mindset even more so than her because she's naturally attuned to some of these things. Whereas she says I'm more the natural writer so she's going to help me in turn with that. And together we're going to put these two things together and see how much we can change the world with it. And benefit the people around us in the process. And our job is not to serve self. We have a bottom line we got to support a family. But our job is to benefit others as well. And anybody who's in, uh, in, a, in a position of success, Eric Worre, Richard Branson, these are just two guys that I can think of off the top of my head. A lot of these other guys will tell you that their greatest success is not that they made lots of money. Their greatest success is that they're able to impact lots of people because their goal is to serve. Their goal isn't to be served nearly as much as it is to serve, benefit, and edify others, build each other and others up to their capacity to reach the heights of their their capabilities that's the job of my writing that's the job of my business with my wife that's our goal and so the purpose of these videos is not so much to um, to share all sorts of innate facts and figures of the business world and marketing and networking and all that kind of stuff as much as it is to just encourage the call to arms people who really have a desire for something more so many just uh, accept the mold of mediocrity. And what I mean by that is society puts them in a little cookie-cutter mold, puts them in a little box and says, stay there, behave, do this, and don't step out of that, don't have any dreams, don't live for your aspirations or your, 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 your capabilities. Just do this because that's what's expected of you. It stifles so many people from reaching the potential that they that is their God-given right to reach, to maximize, to give from to the benefit of others. So my job in this video, these videos, is to call you to step out of the cookie cutter mold, get out of the box, think outside the box. Figure out what it is you want and go after it. Don't let, don't let anybody stop you. My mother once told me, I think I quoted this on the last video, unless it's immoral, unethical, or illegal, there's no reason you can't pursue it. So get up and go do it. Don't wait for other people to do it for you because believe me, it ain't gonna happen. You wait for somebody else to give you your dreams, ain't going to happen. And if you don't live for your dreams, you're going to be building somebody else's. Anybody in the business world will tell you that. Anybody who's built their own thing, especially from the ground up, will tell you that. And 
they'll tell you that they're not self-made. They'll, anybody who's got more than half a brain in, the, in this business, whether it's writing or uh, the arts or business or whatever, will tell you that it's because other people partnered with them, came alongside them, believed in them, gave them a chance. And so it's our responsibility to then pass the torch on and give other people a chance. I put an ad out a couple of months ago looking for just any quick work I can because I've got bills to pay and this now. I had a gentleman here in Adelaide respond to my ad. He didn't go, oh, I got some lawn mowing that, you know, I can get you to do, man. You know, or I, and you can dig a ditch for me or you can weed my garden. No. He opened up a door to an opportunity, not a job. This is an opportunity. My wife and I have an opportunity if you're interested to get out of the cookie cutter mold, to rise to the occasion and do something amazing with your life that will make an amazing opportunity for somebody else, for many somebody else's. But you have to take the gumption to rise to the occasion and say, what is that opportunity and how can I adapt to it? How can I apply it? How can I embrace it? So whether it's my writing or a business, our job is to reach out and give people the same opportunity we've been given. He contacted me and said, I, I've got something I think might work for you guys. Let's meet and let's discuss it. So we met with them and we've gone in a whole new direction we didn't expect, but we know will be worth it. It's not something that you know will happen overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. It requires hard yards. But I'll tell you something. The rewards of the hard yards and the putting yourself to the, to the, to the, the forefront will pay off and be worth it. Not just because you can make a good financial living out of it, but because the impact you can make to others, which will overshadow any of the money you make because really you get so caught up in serving others and seeing others benefit and blossom and develop that the money just kind of goes in the back of your mind and it ceases at the moment. It's in the forefront for us because we've got bills to pay, we've got things to catch up on, things we want to get taken care of. But pretty soon it goes, it goes to the back of your mind and you're not even thinking about because you're so caught up in the benefit you see it being to other people. Same thing I want to do with my writing. I want to benefit others. I want to encourage others. I want to educate others. My first book is about the tail end of the Civil War, presenting to you an alternate version of what we've been told that might be more accurately uh, situated in the truth than what we have been told. My next book is centered around the Mona Lisa and events involving that. The third book that I've started is starting in the 1960s, but we see our character uh, have a flashback recalling the story of his dad's childhood in the 19 and youth in the 1920s, and certain individuals he came across that the history books tell us died like the century before. I won't say what part of that century because I don't want to give it away, but he comes across a couple of characters that are, according to history, supposed to be dead. But my research and watching some documentaries, reading some things, has led me to question that as well because there's more reason to believe that they didn't die that that they, than that they did uh, and I'll leave that there because I want you to read my books to get a full picture of what I'm talking about if I tell y'all now then y'all don't need to read the books so as they get uh, edited and produced and out there which requires money so one of the reasons we're doing our business is to fund the first couple of books as well as the other things we need to deal with and then as the books get out there and on the shelves and then off the shelves then eventually the book process will start paying for itself because then I can take revenue from the, the previous books and put it into the next book, so on and so forth. So that's the three book ideas I have in that series idea I was talking about. Plus I have something on the Templars I want to do, something on ancient Egypt I want to do, something on uh, um, first century, maybe first century Palestine. There's lots of things that I want to do. Um, but the one book I was telling you about that deviates away from all that is a standalone it's about a group of beings that don't actually exist. Based on uh, some inspiration I think I must have indirectly got from Frozen. But the point is, I won't say any more. But suffice to say, that is going to be more of a children's, you know, young teens type of uh, story. Which is just going to be pure, unadulterated fun. Because I don't have to do any research really. I don't have to explain anything. I can be as crazy as I want with my creative capacity with that one. <clears throat> with my history, I could be creative but I have to do it within the context of what was accurate. For example, I can't have my characters riding a train because the Transcontinental Railway didn't exist for another 5, 10, 15 years or whatever after the events in my book. <clears throat> so I can't have them ride a train. That would make no sense. And any of you out there that are historians would think I'm nuts if I tried to get my guys to ride a train across the country in 1865. Wasn't going to happen because it didn't exist. There was little pockets where maybe train travel existed but not across the continent not at that time 
for any of you who've watched Hell on Wheels, you know that it was the tail end of the Civil War that they started working on the train, trying to, to get to the other side of the country. But I think it's 1870s before it's actually completed. But I could be wrong on that. But the point is, 1865 didn't exist. I have to make sure again, as well, for example, what kind of guns did they have? Well, they couldn't have had a Colt Peacemaker, Peacemaker, because I think those weren't developed in the 1870s. So again, I had to make sure that the guns they were using, the type of places they were going, actually existed. The towns they went to actually existed, because a lot of towns didn't crop up till the 1870s, 80s, 90s. So I can't have them go to a town that didn't exist yet. So this is what I'm talking about, the research that's so much fun. But at the end of the day, Without digressing any further, my heart in putting this video together is just to share a bit about my writing, where I'm coming from, and uh, I don't want to say too much because I want you to read it for yourself. I want you to go away from that book or any of those books going, I have a thirst to go on Google and do some research in this subject matter. I want to find out what's the truth versus what I've been told that is the truth. You know, I want you to go explore for yourself because until you do, You'll just keep going on believing what you've been told. And sometimes what you've been told is true or semi-true. I'm not saying it's always false. It's always lies. But don't just accept it without looking into it for yourself and seeing if the um, veracity of it is upheld or not. Because at the end of the day, a lot of times the history books are written by the people who have the power, have the clout, who have a bias. They want to cover something up. Roswell is a good example. I'm not saying I believe in aliens, but I do believe people saw something. I don't think of some government weather balloon nonsense. That's the government covering it up for you. They're really good at that. But I also don't think it was aliens from another planet. And the reason why I don't say that, call me old-fashioned, but it, that's just an example. Because it says in the beginning, uh, he created the heavens and the earth. Not the heavens, the earth, and a bunch of other planets. The heavens and the earth. The reason why the earth is singularly mentioned, aside from everything else, is because it's the only place that inhabits life because the heavens revolve around uh, re refer to uh, the other planets the moons the stars the you know the galaxies the universe all that the earth is singularly mentioned because it is unique in that it is the only one to inhabit life so anybody in nasa or wherever else tells you that oh well, we found some water droplets on mars that must mean there's life there you know, they've been smoking something or they just are trying to find some way to dispute God. But whether you believe in God or not is irrelevant to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's pure logic, man. Check out logically some of these things. Logically, you know, it doesn't make any sense because no other planet has the habitable temperatures, habitable environment for life that we do. People keep looking all over the place trying to find some excuse to, come, to, to refute what is truth. Even science is starting to prove that what it's claimed all these years is not actually the case. On several fronts, science is coming to acknowledge the truth as I know it to be and as any you know buddy who believes in creation knows it to be. So that's just an example of what we've been misled to believe. The government has an agenda and its agenda is to keep the truth from you. The government was not created to be that way, but it has become that way. Because the truth is suppressed in favor of whatever the popular story of the day is. Or the popular version or popular myth, which is just their version of the truth. There is truth, which is an absolute. And then there's all these other versions of the truth. And mo more often than not, people will go with the alternate versions because they're more comfortable, they're more palatable, they're more believable. They don't want to go with the truth because it causes them to step out of their cookie cutter mold, their comfort zone, and to embrace ideas that they're not ready to embrace. Or they don't want to embrace or that... that says something about their belief system, something they need to change inside. My job is not to give you all the answers. My job is to cause you to question, to cause you to go out there and do some research for yourself. And in the process, be a little bit entertained. Feel a little bit better because you read my book. Be a little bit of a better person because you learned something about the Civil War, for example. You learned something about what it means to think for yourself. One of the greatest movies of all time that talks about that, Dead Poet Society. Teacher comes in, John Keating, Keating comes in and says, I'm going to teach you to think for yourselves again, to reason, to, to explore. This is what my endeavor with my books is all about. So if anything I've said resonates with you, is of interest to you, please leave me a, a, a comment on the, on the bottom there. And um, just um, write down below, whether you're on Facebook seeing this, YouTube seeing this, whatever, go to my Instagram, go to my Twitter, whatever way you want to communicate with me. Let me know what you think. You know, 
nice comments, please, of course, um, respectful comments, but leave a comment and let's dialogue, let's communicate. Let's, I want to find out your story, where you've been, where you're going, what you vision, envision. I want to know how I can help put you in the driver's seat of your life. Whether it's our business or through my writing, I want to encourage you. I want to inspire you. And at the end of the day, it's all about you being in the driver's seat of your life. There's only one person who has the right to be in control of your life. And it ain't anybody else on this planet. And there's only one person who has the right to, to lead you in the direction that's going to be best for you because that's his heart intention. It has been from the moment you were conceived. So look to him, not to other people. That is my challenge for you today. To look to him and not to other people. To rise to the occasion. To step outside the cookie cutter mold. To be all that you have the power to be. And you don't need to join the Navy for it. You just need to step outside of your comfort zone and say, what do I want out of life? And more importantly, what can I contribute to life? Because I'll leave with this closing quote. Movie Emperor's Club. I quote movies, I quote, you know, singer songwriters because that's who I am. That's what inspires me. But anyway, you know, conquest without contribution is of no significance. So if you conquest, have a conquest in this life to be rich and make lots of money and whatever else uh, and have your name on billboards everywhere, that's kind of, a, in my opinion, a dumb idea because what's the point? It doesn't benefit really anybody. But anyway, if that's your goal, but you don't contribute anything to the benefit of other people, it's without significance. Richard Branson and Eric Worre, I, I quoted them because they're on the top of my head. They, those are two among many that will tell you the same thing. The best way for you to succeed is letting and helping others succeed. And then you will be a success in ways that all the money in the world will not equal. In the ways all the fame, the prestige, the power in the world will not equal. There's people in Hollywood that prove the difference. There's two kinds of people in Hollywood. The people who live for self and the people who live to use their resources, their talents, their opportunities, the, 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 the things that they've been given to benefit other people. Be these people. Don't be these people. These people do not advance the world. These people do. These people do not benefit others. These people do. These people do not leave the legacy. These people do. Be the person that leaves a legacy. Starting with your family. Whether it's your marriage, your kids, whatever. Open up the door to your heart to see how you can help other people. And I guarantee you will succeed in ways you couldn't have imagined. This is me, Joshua, from Adelaide, signing off for this video. Calling you, challenging you to step outside the box. And if my wife and I can help you to do that, whether it's through our business or just through friendship or, you know, mutual, you know, contacts and networking, whatever it is, reach out to us. Let us know. Reach out to me. Leave a comment down below on any medium that you're on, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is. Leave me a message. Or you can contact my wife and she's on my Facebook as well. You can look for her and communicate with her. Maybe you're a lady that wants to get into business. Maybe you're a fellow mom that just wants another one to connect with. Contact my wife because she is a great resource for wisdom and for encouragement as well. Let us pour our lives into yours. And let's together pour our lives into making this world just a little bit of a better place. My challenge to you, rise to the occasion and you will be a success. So again, this is me signing off for now.